everyone, it's Caitlin Cahill, the geek you need. Today I'm going to show you my process for creating a design for print on demand. I use these designs on Merch by Amazon, Redbubble, and my own Etsy shop that I fulfill through print on demand manufacturers. I'm going to show you how I set up my file, some of the design techniques that I use, and then how I resize it for different products. Now I'm going to be using mostly Photoshop with a little bit of Illustrator. So if you have Creative Suite, this is a great tutorial for you, but a lot of it will still apply to other design programs as well. So let's get started. Now normally I would start with a blank template file that I've created, but I'll show you how I created that template in the first place. So my primary market that I designed for is Merch by Amazon. And one of the reasons is Merch by Amazon gives you a very specific file size that you have to use, whereas other printers allow you to resize a file. And I find that the Merch by Amazon files work well on other printers as well. So I design first for Merch by Amazon, and then I resize it for other platforms. So to begin with, let's start with a t-shirt. I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to do a custom size. Now they require for a t-shirt for it to be 4,500 pixels wide, and then we're going to do 5,400 pixels tall. Now, as long as you have these pixels correct, the resolution actually doesn't matter because it's automatically going to give you the correct size pixels. This resolution or pixels per inch or DPI, as you may see in some programs, only matter if you're creating the document by inches and then it determines the pixels based on this. But because we're putting in the pixel size, you can just leave it at 300. Now, because the printers work in CMYK, which is different than your screen, which is RGB, you want your print file color mode to be this one, CMYK, not RGB, because RGB will give you lots more colors than CMYK is capable of. You might have this bright, beautiful design, but then when it gets printed, it's very muted. So start in CMYK. Now for my background color, I like to choose a medium dark gray. And the reason for this is I find that Colors that have enough contrast on a medium gray will look good on a lot of different shirt colors. I could create background colors for each shirt color. In fact, Merch by Amazon has a pre-made Photoshop template that has them in there, um, but I prefer just to work on a neutral gray. So I'll click OK to get that background color, and then click Create. Here I have my blank canvas. But before I dive in and start designing, there's actually a couple more things I do to set it up. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some guides at the top and on the sides. And the reason for this is I like most of my designs, unless they're really big and just purely graphics. Um, but if they have any text in them, I like them to be about an inch from the top. That'll be about two and a half inches from the collar on Merch by Amazon because this keeps it, you know, it's not all the way up to the collar, so it looks awkward, but it's high enough that it stays higher on the chest, which works well across all sorts of body types. Um, if you center it and it's not a huge design, it can actually get lost. And same with the sides, if you have text and you run it across the whole canvas, sometimes it can be hard to read the design because the text runs around the sides of the body and then it's not as easy to read. So what I'm going to do now is go to View, New Guide. Now for that top one, I'm going to select Horizontal. And now this is in pixels, but because I have 300 pixels per inch, I'm going to put 300, or I could also do one inch, and that'll put a nice horizontal guide for me. And I'm going to do the same for the sides, except I'm going to do an inch and a half on the sides. So I'm going to switch that to vertical. Now, in order to go from the right side, you need to do what it is from the left side. So it's going to be, so in this case, I'm looking for a 12 inch width. So it's going to be 12 plus the inch and a half on the side. So 
So now I have my guides. So this is what I would save as my template file so I don't have to set it up every time and it has the same settings. Now for my design, I'm going to do three lines of text, one curved at the top, one straight across the middle, and one curved at the bottom. And then I'll pop over into Illustrator to grab a vector and put it into this behind the text. Now if you've seen my curving text videos, you know that there's two different ways to curve text. My preferred method is to use a circle object and to put the text on that because it curves the text without actually distorting the text. Whereas the arc option will distort the text at the top or the bottom depending on the direction of your arc. So first we need a circle. So I'm going to go over here to the toolbar and click the circle tool. Now a shape will actually fill in with this color and stroke. I just want the path. So I'm going to change that setting to path. And I'm going to draw my circle. I'm going to click first in the center. Now you'll see it's ovals unless I keep it perfectly straight. So I'm going to press shift and that makes it a perfect circle. Now if I also press alt, it's going to do the circle out from the middle. So now that I have that, I'm going to grab my text tool here from the toolbar. And I'm going to click at the top right on that center dot there. Now you saw the cursor change had a little squiggly line on it. That means when I click, it's going to put the text on that path. Now you can see the text is actually going from the start of the cursor to the right, so it's left aligned. I actually want it to be centered. So here at the top, I'm going to click the Center Align button. and type my text. Now it's upside down and so see this little diamond there is what we need to change. So over on the toolbar again I'm going to go to my path selection tools, the black arrow. Now when you see the cursor change to that icon with the two triangles on the side it's going to let you click on the path and rotate that text around. Now you'll notice if you move the cursor in, it'll also move the text on the inside, which will be helpful when we do the bottom text. But right now I just want it at the top. Now I'm going to adjust the size and font of my text. So over in my character panel, which is signified by this A with a cursor, I can change the size. I can also change the spacing of the letters. Now this font looks pretty good on a curve. Some of them get kind of wonky and you may need to increase or decrease the spacing between your letters. And so you could add or, you know, subtract spacing here. You might also need to switch from metrics to optical or vice versa. Um, it really just depends on how the font was designed. Um, some, their metrics are perfect. Others, you want to let Photoshop adjust it based on what looks better optically. So now that I have the text that I want, I want to move it to where I want it to be. So I'm going to make sure, so if I click on my layer in the layers panel, I'm going to move it down so that the top of the design is at that guideline. And then to center it, I'm going to do the shortcut to select all, which on a Mac is Command A or on a PC, Control A. And then with my Move tool, I'm going to go to the Horizontal Align Center button here. And that will put it in the middle. And then Command D to unselect. So here I have my first line of text. Now to make the bottom, I'm going to copy that layer and then just adjust the text so that the circle is already made for me. So with that layer selected, you can either right click on the layer and find the duplicate option right up there, duplicate layer. Or you can do the shortcut, which is Command J or Control J. Now if you move it, you can see that there's a second layer. Now I want it to curve the other direction though. 
So first I'm going to change the text. I'm going to grab my text tool. You can double click on that T or you can click on the layer itself. And then I'm going to go to that path selection tool like I did before. So now that I have those arrows, clicking on it flipped it to the bottom, which is good, and it automatically put it in the center. If it doesn't, just remember to move your cursor. So if you move it outside the circle, the text goes outside the circle. If you move it in the circle, it moves inside the circle. So now you can see what I mean by having to space out the letters on the curve, because um, sometimes they get bunched together. But before I do that, I'm actually going to change the size of the circle because I find that when the text looks better if the bottom text, because it's on the inside, that the bottom circle is matches the outside of the top circle because that text is on the outside of the circle. So to begin with, I'm going to move it up just a little bit. And then I'm going to go and select the path. So this path selection tool again. So now you can see my circle path. And then what we need to do is we need to transform the path. So go to edit and you can either do free transform path or transform path scale. You can also use the shortcut, which is command T on a Mac or control T on a PC. So now you can see you have the resizing box. I'm going to move the circle up so that it matches the top of the text. And then I'm going to resize, holding down the Alt key so it resizes from the center. So it's approximately the outside of the circle. Now you can see the inside is a little bit more even on the inside of the circle. But now the letters here you can see are still have a little too close together. They run into each other. So that's where I'm going to go up here to this icon that says VA and just add numbers until I get the spacing that I want. So let's start with 40 and see where we go. Didn't add a whole lot, so let's really bump it up. Spacing looks good, looks pretty close to the top text. Normally I would go in and adjust each letter so that it looks, you know, the kerning's just right, but for the purpose of this video, just know that you adjust it there. If you need to adjust one letter, so for example, just the T, you can select just one letter and change the spacing for just that letter. So now I have two sets of text, the top, the bottom. So let's do the center one now. This one I don't need on a circle. So I'm with my text tool selected. I'm just going to click in the middle. Now again, I want to center it. So I'm going to do command A to select all, select my move tool and then center it horizontally. Now, if I also want to center it vertically, but between these two, so not necessarily the center of the document, one thing that I can do is take this, uh, the square marquee tool or selection tool, select from the top down to the bottom, and this gives it a vertical space to center within. So again, go to the move tool and then do the vertical center alignment, and it'll center it within that circle. So now it's centered horizontally and vertically within the circle. So not necessarily the document, but within that selection that I made. So now that I have all the text that I want, I'm going to put all of these text layers into a group. So I'm going to select all three layers and do Command G to group them. You can also right click. And this makes it easy to change all of the text color or add effects to all of the text at once instead of having to do all three layers. 
So for example, if I were doing a um, version in black for light colored shirts, I could double click on the group, add a color overlay, and change the text all at once. I can then toggle that color overlay on and off as I need to. So I have my text, now let's add a design behind it. Now normally I make my own graphics. Um, if I buy a graphic, I make sure to buy one with a license for print on demand because not every commercially licensed image allows you to use them on uh, multiple end products. So you wanna make sure to go and get a properly licensed image if you're not making it yourself. And just remember, just because an image is on Google or the internet doesn't mean you can use it. It's copyrighted by someone else. So if you didn't make it, you should be paying someone for that image, unless it's public domain, but that's a different video. So now I'm gonna go and go over to Illustrator where I have my vector open. Now this is just a freebie that I downloaded from VecDeasy. If I wanted to use it, I'd have to get it licensed. I'm gonna grab this guy here. Now you notice if I click on it, it selects all of them. So I want to go over this. Whoever did this vector was nice enough to group each individual face into its own group. So I can click the bubble next to the group of the one I want. You can see he's selected here. And then I'm going to copy it by doing Command C. You can also go up here to edit and copy there. Now the nice thing is because it's a vector, you wanna use vectors for your images because you can scale to any size that you need. So now when I go back over to Photoshop, I'm gonna click on the background layer because I want it to go behind the text and then I'm going to paste it with Command V. You can also go up to Edit Paste. Now Photoshop will give you a couple different options. I always do Smart Object because what this will do is allow me to edit the vector in Illustrator. So for example, if I want to change the color of the outline or something like that, and then when I change it in Illustrator and save that file, it'll automatically update back in Photoshop. Now you can also put it in as a pixels. So you set your size and then it renders it for you. You can't edit it in Illustrator after that because now it's a bitmap. You can do a path. Um, that really only works if you're going to be editing the path and then you might as well do it in Illustrator anyway. And then the shape layer will make a solid color shape. Um, so unless you have a shape that has only one color, um, you'll want to stick with smart object or pixels. Generally stick with smart objects. Now I'm not going to reuse this one, so I'm not going to add it to my current library. But if it were a vector that I could reuse in multiple designs, so let's say maybe it's a baseball and I do lots of baseball designs. I would add it to my library, then I don't have to open it in Illustrator every time. I can get it from my library panel within Photoshop. So I'm going to enter it as a smart object and click OK. It automatically places it in the center of the document. So again, I'm going to hold down Alt so it resizes from the center. And I'm going to click and drag until I have the size that I want and then move it around. We want his eyes above legend there. Hit enter and it'll enter the object into your document. So this icon here indicates that it's a smart object. So if I want to edit it, I just double click on the preview there and it opens a new version of this vector. So if I want, I could change the colors, the paths, and then anytime I save it, it updates in Photoshop. But we don't need any changes, so we're just gonna close that, go back to Photoshop. So now you can see that my design is off the top, so I'm gonna select both and move them down. With my Move tool selected, I could click and drag it down. I can also use the Shift key with my arrows to just kind of nudge it down a little bit. I'm gonna line it up back. Now you can see with this one, this design is so big, I actually want to center it vertically. And then again with the text, because I try and keep it in these guidelines, 
I'm going to transform the whole design. So now I have a illustration with my text, but as you can see, you know, the text is kind of hard to read on an image like that, right? So let's put outline around the text, but I don't want a color outline. I want the color of the t-shirt to go through so that I don't have to pick a color that goes with all the different t-shirts. So I have a video on this technique alone, but I'll show you how to do it in here as well. Now there's a couple different ways you can use the knockout feature on layer effects. I prefer masks. They're just a little quicker for me if I'm doing just one design. I usually use knockout on uh, templates. So this is how I'll use a mask to do it. So I have all three of these layers. Now I could make this into a smart object and select them all at once that way. The other thing I can do is turn off the illustration below and grab my wand tool. Make sure sample all layers is selected and contiguous is not selected because that would only select one letter. And now it'll select all of the white pixels. So in this case, the text. So now that I have my selection, I'm going to expand the selection so it goes wider than the letters. So from my select menu, modify, expand, I'm going to start with 20 pixels. Now what I need to do is apply that as a mask to the illustration below. So if I click the mask button, it's going to mask out the things that are outside of the selection and only show what's in the selection. So I want the opposite. So instead I'm going to go to layer, layer mask, hide selection. Now you can see it added a nice little stroke around the letters that will be the color of whatever is below the text there. So in this case, a t-shirt. Now I want to move this illustration up so his eyes are up here or the text down conversely. Um, but I want to keep this mask aligned to the text. So because I want to move the illustration but not the text, I'm going to click this link icon between the two, which will unlink them. So if I click on the mask and move it, I'm moving just the mask. In this case, I'm going to click on the illustration and move just the illustration. Now because I'm moving the text with it, now that I have the illustration where I want, I need to relink it and then it all moves together. Now, if I want even more contrast, um, I could add color to the font. I could also distress the illustration behind it by adding kind of a rough texture. And so because I already have a mask for the text, I could distress right on this mask. Um, but I like keeping my masks separate just so that I have the ability to change them, change the text mask without affecting the distressed mask. So I'm actually going to create a group with just this layer and I'm going to add a new mask. So now this mask, I can edit either or without affecting the other one. So now from my brush panel, which I can get to from over here, I'm going to select the brush that I want. Now there's lots of distressing brushes out there. The key is to pick one that is a purely black and white vector because if you're printing on something like a t-shirt, a black t-shirt, most companies will put down a white ink layer first. And if you have any sort of um, semi-transparent, semi-opaque pixels, you might see what's called ghosting. So you might see some of that white ink come through because um, the white ink will show through the semi-transparent color above. So you wanna make sure that when you're creating brushes or downloading brushes, that they have 100% contrast and there's only black and white. So I'll pick my brush, set my ink color over here to black. I could also have done um, the default colors and then just switched them there. 
So I'm on my mask with my brush. Click. So now you can see the color of the t-shirt will show through um, those spots where I painted. If I want, I can change the rotation of it, of the brush, and do it again, and it'll fade it out even more for a really grungy look. And then let's make it pop with a different color. Christmas design, let's go with something green. Now you'll notice if I go to something neon or outside of the CMYK color profile, you'll get this little exclamation mark. So just because you can pick a color doesn't mean that it'll print well. So if you see this warning, it's telling you that the color you've selected is outside of the range of colors that you'll be able to print. So an easy way fix is to click the box it should suggest um, and that it'll automatically select a color that's within your color profile and closest to what you had selected before. So now that I have my design, um, I'll show you how to save it and resize it for different products. So if I save it now, it'll have this gray background, which is not what I want. So I'm going to click the eye next to background to turn off the background color. Now my Photoshop is set to export as a PNG. I believe the default these days is a JPEG, um, which you can change in settings. You can also do a save as. I love the export option because it's much quicker. So I go to export, quick export as ping. Make sure to give it a descriptive name so you can find it later. I usually do the name, the text of the actual shirt, unless it's really long, then I'll shorten it. So here I might do the man, the myth, Santa. And then I append it, my file name, with the type of file it is. So I would save the layered file as a Photoshop document with this name. And then when I'm exporting as a PNG, I'll save it as shirt. So now that I have the t-shirt layout, I also want to make the hoodie for Merch by Amazon, as well as their new bag and pillow template as well. Um, I could also do phone and pop socket and all of that. But uh, the phone template I typically manually resize just because it's a different ratio than most of my designs. So that I do manually. I'm going to show you how to automatically resize a t-shirt into a hoodie and save it as an action so you can reuse it over and over. So I'm going to save this as its own Photoshop document and actually open the t-shirt version so that I'm not changing the Photoshop original. So now that I have my PNG open, now what I need to do is change the canvas size and resize my image. So you can just do it manually every time, but like I said, I like to do it with an action. And if you've never used actions before in Photoshop, what they do is they record all the steps that you do. So the next time you wanna do that, you click play and it does all the actions automatically. So over in my Actions panel, if you don't see it, go to Windows and open up Actions. I'm going to create a whole new folder for my own Actions. And then click the plus button to start a new Action. Now I usually do two different hoodie resizes. I do one where the image is centered in the middle. And then for images that aren't very tall, so for maybe just one line of text, I'll do one that's closer to the top. Not as close as a t-shirt because of the drawstrings, um, but it's more of a crop than it is a center. So for this one, I'll show you how to center it. So I'll do, I'll call it hoodie center. Now, as soon as you click record, every click that you do will be recorded in the actions. So to begin with, let's change the canvas size. So under the image menu, go to canvas size. And the width is the same for the Merch by Amazon hoodies. It's the height that needs to change to 4,050 pixels. 
keep the dot there because we're going to center the image. If I were doing the crop, I would put it to the top. We're going to center. Click OK. It's going to warn you that it's going to clip the canvas. Um, and that's OK. It's not actually going to clip your image, just the canvas size. So click Proceed. Now you'll see my image um, is a little off the top. So as part of this action, before we stop recording, we want to center the image. So we're going to select all with that command A, control A shortcut. Go to our move tool and then center in both directions. It should already be centered horizontally, but doesn't hurt to add it to the action. So now that I have it centered, I'm going to unselect the canvas with Command D. Now I do want to resize this image, but I don't want to record it as part of the action because each t-shirt design I do will be a different size. So now I'm going to stop recording my action and I'm going to do Command T to resize my image. And now I have my hoodie design. So again, now I'm going to go to File, Export, Quick Export as PNG, Change Shirt to Hoodie. So now I have a copy of this that's sized for the hoodie. Now the next action that I do, because it works really well from hoodie, is I'll do the bag or pillow template for Merch by Amazon. It's a square template that's 2,925 pixels by 2,925 pixels, so it's a square, and you should add a color background to it. Um, otherwise, you'll just have the white of the pillow fabric behind it. So a couple different things to do here. Because I did the center hoodie on this one, I can just resize the canvas and then add my background color. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to add a new action. Now this one's a little bit different because what I'm going to do first is I'm going to resize the image. So I'm going to go to image, image size, and I want the width in pixels to be that 2925 pixel size. Click OK. So now it shrunk down my image and now I need to change the height so that it's a square. So this time I'm going to change the canvas size. So now you can see the width and the height are both 2925 pixels. Now with the pillow and the bag, because there is some seaming on the sides, what I'll actually often do is now that I have the correct canvas size is I'll resize the image again and just shrink it by about 90%. That'll give some space around the image so it's not lost into the seams. So to do that, I'll Command T to transform. And then up here in the width and the height, I have the link selected so they'll match put 90% and we've added just a little bit of space around the outside. So now we need our background color. So to do this, I'm going to go up to layer, new fill layer, solid color. And then I move that layer below the image. Now if I go back to my Actions panel, because remember we're still recording, that's all the steps I need for a bag or pillow template. So now I can click Stop. And that action can now be reused on future designs. Now because this is square, it's also a great one to do with the pop socket next. So let's do one more. So for the pop socket, do image, image size, and put that at 485 pixels. 
and click OK. Now note that that action will only work from the bag. Um, you can't start with the t-shirt dimensions and go to the pocket pop socket because they're different ratios. Um, the t-shirt's rectangular and the pop socket's a square. So I'm actually going to stop this action because it's the size it needs to be. And I'm going to rename that. I'm going to call it bagged pop socket. So I know for the future, I need to start with a bag size image. But now that we have these actions, I can reuse them on all my future t-shirt designs. So let's go ahead and let's try that. So let's close this. I'm going to reopen that t-shirt file just so you can see how they work. So now I have my t-shirt size PNG. So from my actions dialog, I'm going to click my hoodie first and then click the play button. So it makes the canvas the correct size, but again, you'll want to resize it yourself. There is a way to fit the image in the action automatically, but I find that the size is always too small. So we're going to go ahead and just manually resize it. I would save this as my hoodie go to my pillow slash bag template, play that one. Now the nice thing about this action, because I did a color fill layer, let's say I want a different background color. I can double click on that layer and pick a completely different color for my background before I save the template. So now I have a different color background. Now that I have that saved, I can go to my pop socket and then export that as a PNG for my pop socket files. So then one more file size that I'll make using a template is a two-sided mug. So this is another template that I've created for myself so I can just reuse it every time. And so what I'll do is I'll start with, in this case, the Redbubble mug template. I find that it works well on multiple different platforms. So on the Redbubble template, you want to keep your design within these dotted lines because that's the standard size mug. The space above and below is for larger mugs, such as a latte mug. Now, if you have a huge, beautiful design um, that's more of a graphic, you could go right to the edge, and you should. But if you're doing, you know, something more commercial, like the t-shirt design that I have, where you have text, you don't want the text to get cut off. So you want to keep it within the dotted lines here. Now, I'm going to use smart objects so that I can add one version of my illustration and it'll automatically put it on both sides. Similar to how I used the smart object from Illustrator, but in this case, I'm going to do a smart object of my hoodie template file. So from the file menu, I'm going to go to place linked, select my hoodie sized file. I'm going to resize it so that it's the size of the dotted lines. You could give it more space too if you want. And then I'm going to move it. If you turn on the transform option, it'll actually show you the bounding box or the edges of the hoodie file. So I want to line the outside edge with this outside trim edge here. And then I'm going to select all and vertically align it again, just to make sure it's centered there. Now, because this is a linked file, when I make a copy of this layer, it's going to be of the same exact hoodie file. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it over on the other side. So now that I have my linked layers placed where I want them, when I save the file, I'll obviously want to turn off the guides and the Your Art Here background. Save it so as a transparent background, or I could add a background color. But now the next time I would save this as a template, save it as a Photoshop file, 
And then the next time when I have a design to make into a mug, I right click on one of the linked layers, except you have to do it on the text, not the thumbnail, and then select replace contents. Find another hoodie size file. You could do it with any fi size file, but if you do it with hoodie, it'll do the correct placement and size. And now you can see it updated both linked files to the right size and the right placement. And all I have to do is export and it's ready to go for another mug. And there you have it. Now you have a t-shirt size, a hoodie size, you have your pop socket, you have your pillow and your bag ready to go, and a mug now too. So you're all set to upload to multiple different platforms. And using the same size for all your different files from Merch by Amazon to other platforms like Redbubble allows you to easily copy listings and put your new design in the copied listing. Save these templates, reuse those actions, and you'll cut down and be much more efficient in your designs. I hope this was helpful. Let me know any questions you have in the comments.